everybody. Welcome to EDIC's July 20th, 2021 meeting being held virtually once again. So don't get excited. We don't know when we're going to be back in person. Or nobody's told me anyway. Um, so uh, that's how this is going to go. I'm not reading the formal thing. We've been doing this for over a year. It's fine. <laughs> um, EDIC's mission is to support and enhance the economic environment for current and future businesses, residents, and the community at large, and that is why we're here today. Um, I would like to ask, hi Paul, um, whether everybody's had a chance to review the June 15th and June 29th meeting minutes. So we're going to approve them separately, I guess, because there were different people there. It doesn't matter. If you were there, you get to vote. If you weren't, you don't. Um, so uh, do we have a motion to approve some minutes? I make the motion. Second. Outstanding. Um, so all in favor of approving the June 15th, 2021 regularly scheduled EDIC meeting minutes, raise your hand or holler aye. Aye. Great. Unanimous approval. All of those who were in attendance at the June 29th uh, meeting, the specially scheduled meeting, if you are in favor of approving those meeting minutes, holler I or raise your hand. All right. Paul, you weren't there. Is that right? Is that why you didn't vote? It was, uh, no, I was there. I'm in favor. Yeah, I wondered about that. Okay. I was not, so I didn't not. vote. Yes, correct. So. Unanimous approval by those who were in attendance. Thank you very much. Um, we have reserved some time for public speak. There are no members of the public here. If there's something that you'd like to share now that isn't on our agenda, that you wish was on our agenda, do say so. Great. So, Jeff, we have given you from 4.10 to 4.30, a very timely amount of time, um, to give us some updates from the planning department. In particular, we're seeking any updates about school reuse RFPs, the ways that you're thinking about those, wayfinding, the local rapid recovery project, and anything else germane to EDIC's purview. Thank you. I don't think I'll need that much time. Um, to start just in the order that you have them on the agenda, so the school reuse rfp so you know we're in the we're we've been doing things to set up that process there will be a committee that will be appointed by the mayor and as of right now it seems like um that committee might meet for the first time in like september um but in the meantime kind of in the lead up to that um we have funding for a consultant um who it's it's a it's one of the same consultants who did the downtown strategic plan which kind of laid the foundation the the next step is to take that the, those some of those elements a little bit further um and what we're going to be doing is um reviewing similar RFPs that have been put together for other, you know, school reuse projects in Massachusetts. Um, we're going through and we're kind of outlining the technical process that, you know, there's a there's a quite a few steps to this process um, that involve the school committee, then the city council, then, you know, eventually an RFP will be released that will solicit <coughs> developers to look at the schools. As of right now, it looks like we probably won't re we won't really be releasing an RFP for the schools until like next May or June. So we kind of have like the September um, through the winter, through the spring, and then kind of some sometime early next summer we'll be releasing the RFPs. So I think you know I, I think pretty soon we'll be able to put together the website which will outline all this stuff, and I think maybe maybe by the August meeting, but definitely by the September meeting, I think we'll have a little bit more. We'll have, a, we'll have a couple of documents. One of the things that consultants working on right now is kind of just an outline of what the process will look like. And so as soon as that's kind of ready, the committee will have a first meeting in September and then we'll start, you know, putting out the information that's available. The big thing, and I can't remember if I mentioned this last time, is the, the state um, revised um, like basically like 10 of their grant programs 
and consolidate it into this thing called the One Stop for Growth. And, you know, it takes, we've, um, East Hampton's been really successful with Mass Works before. So we got one for Ferry Street and behind the mills. So instead of Mass Works and, you know, the eight other um, grant programs, where it's consolidated all into one. And what they're looking for municipalities to do is take your project and figure out where you are um, and where you need to go. So it's like a continuum. And so what we put in for funding for was um, due diligence for the school properties. Um, and so we won't know until if we get that until like November. But the idea is that we don't have um, surveys, um, like survey of the school properties. We don't have that. So one of the projects would be to do the existing condition surveys. Um, another thing that anyone will want looking at the schools is some basic environmental testing. So it's called like a phase one environmental report where they look at the site, they look underground and they make sure there's no contamination. And then for this type of school property, they would look at look for lead and asbestos. And so our the funding request would, would fund someone to do that kind of this winter and early spring. Um, then there's some building code analysis and a structural engineer would walk the school properties. I mean, we, our kids are in there, so we think they're structurally sound, but the, one of the things that they can do is say, so it's a school. And if you change it to mixed use, um, or housing or just commercial, like what kind of building code requirements would get triggered. And that's to help understand the costs associated with renovating the schools. And then the last piece that we asked for a lot um, would be to, to, to do survey of the surrounding neighborhoods and sidewalks and crosswalks. Because what we've found is that for any, you know, the, the schools were built for that purpose. And some of the sidewalks and areas around it have not been touched. Um, so we need to have survey of all the road and sidewalks and crosswalks before we can do anything to be looking at what improvements need to be there. So, so it's a lot of due diligence that we're hoping to accomplish, have available for the committee, and it would also be available on the website for once we release the RFP so that developers can see all this information and it's all information that they don't have to go gather. So we're trying to make the sites more shovel ready and a lot more appealing. So that's a big a question. Yes, please. Um, I've heard you say two times RFP, whereas in the past we've said RFPs or RFP, I thought. Is it, are we now thinking specifically this is a one RFP project? No, I guess I'm, I'm that's a good question. No, I think I'm just saying that in shorthand, I think that's still a question that the committee will have to look at. You know, it, it, there are, there's one scenario where we, where we release individual RFPs for each of the three schools. But I think, you know, the conversation right now is that we want the maximum flexibility. So we, 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 we would like to have it laid out that a developer could reply to one if they just want to look at center or they could look at all three and come in combined. Um, but we have not gotten into the official, like how that's gonna unfold. That'll probably happen in like the winter. Um, this, uh, this grant that we put together and the narrative, it's pretty extensive. It's all posted on the website now. We, we redid the city's website. So under the planning department, we have current projects and you can find the one stop for growth and click in and see the whole narrative. And I, I think it would be worth sharing with this group kind of specifically by email. Maybe I said I was gonna do that last time. I apologize if I did say that and I didn't. Um, so that's just a big project that's kind of just starting to ramp up now. And it will certainly become, you know, something that we are all talking about um, come probably like the fall. Um, I think maybe wayfinding was on the list next. Um, if. Gwen, do you mind, can I share, I just want to show up one image, um, but we did a, a stakeholder meeting for this project recently. I think Josh was there kind of on behalf of EDIC and we had kind of another group. It was about 18 people um, from across East Hampton to kind of just see this idea. And from here, um, we will finalize a report and it'll go to city council and it'll kind of conclude phase one 
Um, and then as we roll into the winter and spring, we're hoping to start talking about where we would put these signs and how much they would cost and getting some funding to do that. So um, let me see here. I'll just show one of the images if I can find it. So this also on the new website, we I posted some information about the wayfinding project, and um, next probably next week I'll be able to post the video from the meeting. But this is the slide presentation that the consultant um, walked through with the group, and so it was a recorded meeting, and so we will make it available for anyone who wants to circle back. So just as a reminder, this is the ECA map. Um, EDIC was involved, wrote a letter of support. I mean, we've talked about this. This is really kind of the impetus for it. This this map here is the basis for where we would go. And then it shows the, some iterations of the drawings. Um, we talked about Mount Tom as being kind of this kind of easily identified iconic image. Um, we, I think I previewed these signs last time briefly, but the fun part was that the consultant started to put together, I'll stop in a second here. It's this one. Um, it's called sort of a family of elements. And what it starts to lay out is we would have different size and type of signs depending on the location. Um, so there's kind of the larger ones on the left here. And then so you, like, you have the parking one here. That's the, the, the letter C's, if you can see that. Then the taller one would be, the idea would be that those are for pedestrians or on the bike path or something. And maybe those go along with like, that sign F, which is the smaller one. So we're starting to see this come together in terms of a concept and there will be a report that goes to city council to kind of conclude phase one. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I mean, nothing's happening yet until we do some locations and maybe we can um, bring in some members of this group to the exercise would be if once we get a map, like a base map of East Hampton, we can then take the types of signs and plug and play and get input as to where people think they would be best suited. Um, I think the trick will be finding city owned property that's in the right spot where the signs can kind of go pretty easily. So I think next meeting, this just happened like last week. Um, so I'll have a next meeting. I'll be able to, I think I'll be able to provide a little bit more information as well. And then you, yes. question about the wayfinding. Yeah. Um, is there like I know that there are some signs that are, like city signs like in like some of the cemeteries and some of the parks that are like really rough. Is there any way through the wayfinding programming and getting these signage that we might be able to look at um, updating, replacing some of the the really bad shape or damaged signs that the city already has, but maybe aren't necessarily like you know along the lines of navigational necessarily. But yeah. is that possible? I think it's possible. It's probably if we broke it out into, I'm just generalizing a lot right here, but if, if we're in phase one, which is the, this initial kind of graphics, uh, phase two would be the first round of trying to install some. And then I think once we got to there, we would go into phase three and look at parks um, or other, or other facilities that might, that might, you know, where we want might want to direct people to, um, you know, John Mason has been involved in this discussion quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so so if you take like Nantuck Park as one of the examples of one of our biggest parks, you know, that will end up somewhere on the list of signs and, you know, Nantuck, Paul, like it's so it's, it's one of our biggest assets, but it's really hard if you're not from East Hampton, it's, it's like there's no signs to direct you to Nantuck Park or how to leave Nantuck Park. So I think those it just will come a little bit later. I think the first um, emphasis was on the business districts, just kind of get people oriented there. And then I think it will build on that. So hopefully that answers your question. I think it's, I think it's definitely been talked about as a later phase. All right, great. I have a question too, Jeff. Yep. Um, <laughs> you said the trick is finding city owned property are there any workarounds for that? Like, are there like agreements you can make with non-city property owners to put a sign on, on their property? Yeah, it's called, it would be an easement. Yeah. Um, that would be the mechanism to do it, I guess. It's just most, 
<laughs> it's it, yeah it's it we usually have it involves like costs so it'd be a surveyor who would have to create a survey of the easement area and then you have to go to city council to get approval and sometimes they ask for money um but you know generally speaking the most roads you have the paved part of the road and then you have some number of feet on each side right so most of these would probably want to go uh adjacent to the road yeah it's just i think when we encounter like I, and I'm just making this up, but when we encounter like that one spot where like we need to have this sign here, yeah. like then we might need to we might need to talk about easements at some point to just okay. to have the approval to do that. All right, great. Okay. Um, okay. So the only I think the only other one I want to talk about. Oh no, sorry. Two the local rapid recovery. So that's our response to COVID, and we did have. You know, meeting a couple, I think I brought, I, I can't remember, I really apologize the last time I talked to the committee about this, but we had a presentation from the consultant and we're working on fleshing out projects that will go into the report. And the reason why I wanted to mention it is because um, we see phase two of wayfinding kind of being a project uh, because the idea is that if we're listing projects in this report, it will enable us to to go for funding later, um, whether it's ARPA, which is the funding source of the day that everyone likes to talk about, or if there's some other kind of COVID relief funds that become available. If we have projects in the list, then that makes us eligible. Um, there's a couple other that we don't have the project list finished. So as soon as we do, we're able to bring in outside consultants to help talk about the project. And I, I'm mentioning that because I think um, some or all of this group would be good to have come to a Zoom meeting if we're bringing in a consultant to talk about projects that relate, you know, at all to like economic development. Um, so I would like to be keeping the group in the um, kind of a, by email, kind of informed of any meetings that we have coming up in like the next month. And Mo from the chamber has kind of been the EDIC member who's kind of been involved in that. I saw I saw Cassie had a question. Yeah, is this the presentation that? had the results of the survey in it. Yes. That is a really interesting presentation. And uh, I just wanted to underscore one point that's in it. Regulation, the respondents said uh, rules and regulations or ordinances or whatever don't pose a barrier to business development in East Hampton. It was way down on the list. And I know we had talked about that at one point, tackling that. So it really kind of showed that it wasn't an issue for people yeah i think I, I agree i mean i think it could there could still be some issues that we want to fix but it, it wasn't like the overarching issue that you know business owners respond we had pretty good response rate if i remember correctly we yes. had like 60 60 responses 60 or 80 but i think that was pretty high compared to if you compared us to other communities and how many of their businesses responded. So I think we did good. There's a video of that. So I also uploaded that to the new website too. So, you know, all this stuff is kind of available. I just, I, I apologize for not being so in tune to get this committee up to speed all the time, but it is there. And I think it's an evolving project. So I, we got a lot of projects underway right now. So it's, it's just been like a flood. Um, the last thing, knowing that I said I wasn't going to go to 430, is um, you know we all we we probably all know and heard that we the city council passed the accessory dwelling unit ordinance. So you know, applaud to this group who was really kind of pushing early. Congratulations, for that Chris. Yeah, Chris did a lot of work. Other people, you know, everyone was invested in that one. Um, and if I I'm going to share my screen again, one thing I'm we're trying to finish it up because we're running out of time with our consultant, but. We did talk about a guide that would be available for residents to, who might be interested in exploring this. So I can share this really quick, maybe. Um, it's in its kind of second to last draft form. So don't pick it apart too much. But I was having trouble with this. Before. I can't get the top. I can't get my screen to show the top. I apologize. But we're... It was going to be an 11 by 17 fold, a fold up version. Um, that's kind of what we asked for. And then recently I just asked for them to see if they can reconfigure this. So it'll be online. So it's a little bit, cause right now it's a little bit cumbersome because we're looking at it online and it's supposed to be a paper copy, but basically it goes through 
um, kind of before you begin the process, make sure you ask yourself these questions. And we talked about ways to um, show that like this, this is the, the green box. You want it inside, outside, attached or detached. Um, and then to start explaining kind of the steps you need to go through to, to evaluate whether this is for you or not. Um, I'm getting lost in Zoom land here, I apologize. But we, the second page kind of on the left describes what an ADU is. The ADU requirements is pulling out the major pieces of our zoning that we revised and made it easier. And then this image on the right is some graphics that the consultant had about showing um, like the one that I, sorry, kind of like the most is sort of this one that like a visual explanation of zoning terms. So this graphic gives people kind of the basic things that they might need to start looking at whether an ADU would be for them. And the key thing we're trying to figure out right now is if we could find someone at a local bank who we could start like directing people to because the financing is really kind of the biggest thing now because you take out all the zoning hurdles, you know, how do people kind of figure out how they're going to pay for this, finance it and that kind of thing. So that's the last part of that they're working on. Um, yes. And Chris asked if I can share that with us. So I would like to do that and maybe ask if you guys have any feedback, if, if I can build like a little bit of a short review period, because like I said, we're at the end, we're kind of at the end with our consultant on this one, but if there's something glaring or really problematic that you see, I think we can squeeze in some more changes. So I'm happy to send that. I'm going to have to do it right after our meeting. So I don't forget. It looks great. It does it's very beautiful um jeff are you already talking to local banks about that where we where we kind of stopped was i don't i it doesn't the person's name doesn't have to be mentioned here but like okay. knowing who to talk to at es bank esb or florence bank yeah. you know if there's people who do who do either the you know like a construction loan yeah. or refinancing like it'd be great to talk to somebody there and just know a little bit more of what they would say to people i mean like i think we know the basics and i think it says it but like you need you probably gonna need an appraisal yeah. of your property yeah. then you know then you're gonna need to know where your finances are so all those like the nitty-gritty of how much debt to income you have then it might kind of spit you out the other side and say you, you might be eligible for this much money yeah um, and then from there, there's just a million different ways where people get money. So, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different paths. So that doesn't that sound like a perfect way to get Tom Brown to help you? Yeah. Retired banker, Tom Brown. You've yeah. heard of Tom Brown. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's volunteer him that this is his <laughs> job now to help you. I'll That'd write it down. That'd be fine with that. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> so... You know, that's, I mean, that's just quick. Those are quick updates. I, there's so much going on and I, it's just so hard. I, we're, I'm really trying to put some focus on the new website to get more information up there. Um, but, you know, this, this group's been committed to kind of all these projects. So those are the ones that I wanted to kind of give an update on. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Jeff or, or um, applause or confusion? Jeff, that's beautiful. The um, what you just showed us. It seems like you're you've been doing a good job on that. Um, I appreciate. It. We're going to post something on the website as soon as this guide's kind of polished up. You know, that's where it's going to live. Is are you interested in ADU? Like, go here. Jeff, I would add. Um, could I be uh, nominated to be on this future school use thing? Uh, my time is not very great these days, but. I've got a lot of familiarity with city buildings and the whole process. And I, I have, you know, I'd like my two cents added. Yeah. I'll double check. The mayor had a list and I think that letters went out to people. I think Chris got a letter. Um, and, and I, I did. Well, <laughs> from what I recall, the conversation about Chris was that he was on the, right. So the, the downtown plan had a sounding board, kind of the same thing that the steering committee and that Chris was the one who would bridge that gap 
with with that committee and the EDIC. So I'll double check. Um, I don't I don't know for sure if all the letters went out or if everyone's been asked. So um, Casey, I think that's fine. I'll, I'll I'll put that to the mayor. It's really like things that she's doing, um, and then I'm gonna run run with that after it's after it's all set. Great. I know. Perfect. In the interim, Casey, just tell Chris to be your lackey and just give him all your opinions. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay. What else is happening? What did we decide was going to go on today? Oh, boy, you guys. Yeah. We're a minute ahead. Oh. So we can continue our discussion of social media and downtown transit. I have information from... Tom Brown in absentia. Hold on for a second while I find it. Um, he says, I don't have any updates about the use of the COA van for downtown shuttle use. We have a little bump in the road with the COA director leaving on August 6th. So he will most likely follow up directly with the mayor to pursue that option. So that's the update on that. Um, I don't think we had other tasks related to that at this point. That's where we were thinking. Um, although I think we were going to connect, Tom was going to connect with um, the Keystone um, building place. Casey? I think that might have been me. Um, I spoke with um, Kelly Ritchie, who's the head of the licensing board and the manager of that building. I asked specifically about Fridays for Art Walk and she said that the vehicle is available for rentals with the driver, so everything is part of the package. If uh, I asked her if Friday night was something they'd be interested in, she said she didn't know about the availability, but it would be right up their alley. Erin um, is on vacation this month, so she said hold off or or you know process when I had time. I haven't had time, but it sounds like it's feasible to get something together. Jeffrey, the art walk is September 3rd. Yeah, the first Friday. So that does put a little bit of a pinch, but I don't think it's that far of a stretch. I think that um, it's a question of desire. Uh, we're busy and we're short staffed. So everybody else is in the same boat. So the idea of more traffic coming to our places might be daunting, but it might be manageable by then. I don't know. I just... Uh, or maybe it's not for the businesses, but it's for the art. So it's still a good thing. Um, so I think that that's still something to have on the conversation. I think I will come with, um, what, August 17th is the next meeting? Sure, could be. I Let's think find out. What you have on there. Yes. But I, I can certainly give us information and do as much as I can that uh, have a presentation available to be approved by September 3rd um, because it might all just fall together. Okay. I have a question Gosh. about this. I think this is great um, kind of research. Did maybe you don't have to say the the amount, but did did they talk about the amount? What it would be for like a Friday night? No. Okay. No, but the other part of that, Jeffrey, is that there's money. Businesses have money now, and they could do some sponsorship. You know what I mean? It's it's no. if it's if it's a win win situation. Um, it's not that much money, I wouldn't think. You know right. what I mean? Um, for Four hours, a couple of business to pony up a hundred bucks. It's not that big, big of a deal. Yeah, the the two things real quick that I had kind of just occurred to me as we as you were talking was maybe maybe there's a and I don't know for sure, but maybe there's a role for the ECA coordinating committee. Um, you know, they have funds available for this kind of thing, but I don't know if they have any like Pascalina. Like I don't know if there's any capacity to take it on, but there could be like a synergy. With ECA, so one thing, um, Casey, if you had it in you to just bust out a quick email to maybe Pascalina and ask about, you know, talking to ECA at their, I don't know when their next meeting is, but it's probably coming up. So just to broach the subject with them, that's kind of one thing. The other thing is um, that the spot in Northampton um, where they did Strong Ave and they closed it down, and they have kind of a brewery and some food and some tables, it, you know, that was initiated and done by by a business owner um where they took they really just took kind of the initiative 
and they found the funding and they got permission to close the street, but they did a lot of the legwork. So that kind of goes to your idea of businesses who, you know, if there's, if you, if there's a way to find businesses who would pay for it and then come up with a quick way to coordinate it somehow, at least even as a pilot, right. That's what we talked about last time. Just a, like a test run. Yeah. So I don't know how to take it from the idea that we have to, to, to making it happen. I don't know how to do that yet. Well, that's, that's kind of like a party or a function that I do. So, you know, I've got connections and I can make some, some phone calls and conversations with people and, you know, basically put together a package that can happen or not. You know I mean? It's just a question of you guys sort of getting one shot to hear at next meeting and then be sort of like, all right, we trust you. We're, we're sponsoring this or we're agreeing to this. Um, or not, we switch to the next October. Uh, but I think that it's it's totally a, kind of a low-hanging fruit. It's it's one driver. You know, if ECA can step in and help, that'd be great. You know, do with some signage and uh, some... some. Are there, is there going to be print material for the art walk? Yeah, see, I think that's the that would be the good conversation with ECA is that they, they're doing some programming and events. And so yeah. I think we talked about this last time that, like... The, the shuttle, the trolley would want to correspond to some events or something where they can come, like, be, we would have to have that coordination of events. Yeah. So that's where I think that's definitely where ECA would come in. I don't know that they'll come in financially, uh, but knowing the event schedule, and I think the my understanding is that the spot lot, yeah. so the 50 pace in lot, um, was going to be reactivated in the fall too. So those are the kind of things that ECA might be helpful with. Okay, so have we tapped the transit conversation for the moment? All right, who wants to talk about social media? So I'm going to share my screen, y'all. It literally took me a whole month to make this, and then I did it this morning. So, um, I think our goal is to improve awareness of city and community efforts to sustain and improve the economic landscape for residents and businesses in whatever way we decide to manifest that improvement of awareness. So I listed a bunch of options here. We can mix and match. We can come up with new whatever. This is a fully editable deal. How readable is it? Should I make it bigger? Would you like that? How's that? Is that better? That seems to work. Okay. So we have talked in the past about sharing a uh, notice of municipal meeting agendas, posting municipal meeting minutes. We have talked about encouraging positive public speaking ahead of projects. So instead of the um, everybody react, now it's 18 months after we started talking about this project, now there's a news story because they're breaking ground. Now you're mad. Instead, give people so much opportunity to understand why this is a good thing and come and and encourage uh, positive support for those sorts of projects, which is a very different thing from posting municipal meeting agendas. News stories about businesses, development, housing, things that are of interest that are germane to what EDIC thinks about. And then something else that I don't know that we haven't talked about. We have in the past talked about it possibly being uh, volunteer extraordinaire Kim Douglas similar community volunteer that we say, okay, great, you go do that and we'll make sure it's okay, which does involve some kind of like uh, confidence in that. It could involve all EDIC members. It could involve EDIC members in some kind of, okay, Chris has September, Paul has October, Casey has November. Or it could be on a quarterly basis. I mean, a weekly basis sounds like a nightmare, so I didn't even write that here. Um, it could be a select person, someone who cares so much about performing this task that they are a member of EDIC who holds that specific role and they're amped about it. Those seem like reasonable options. There are probably other options that I didn't think of, but I don't know what they are. Um, this could be, depending on what we decide we wanna share on an as needed basis, it could be weekly, it could just, it could be deciding that you're gonna commit to 
at least weekly and have something to say. Maybe you have a, a selection of things that you could post about, including municipal meetings, including news stories, including in particular, here's why you should care about going to this city council or whatever other meeting. Um, and then how? I think a lot of these decisions will be driven by how do we actually want to monitor and manage this? Because content management in a social media world is not super straightforward. So is this just objective, neutral, here's information? If so, how do you, how do you field or respond to comments? Whose responsibility is that? Or is this a comment-free zone where you can comment all you want, but we're not ever going to respond? Hard to think about. We have a um, non-neutral community that participates in social media. So it's something to think about there. Are we advocating for something? So I think that
is increasing the tax base in East Hampton and is a net gain, like if you felt that way or whatever. But so that's going to be the hard part is when you get, when you try to take a position on something, you know, you wouldn't want one member just shooting off in Facebook land opinions that don't represent the whole committee. That's the, that's the real trick, I think. Well, I can say when this format looks really good, and I think that sort of spells out um, what it is as far as content we're getting. I mean, just for an example, Jeffrey saying that there's a new city website. Well, I wasn't aware that was coming and, you know, how useful that is to me um, and also, you know, other business owners or basically residents that they'd be a nice way to try to get that out to the public. Another way to get that out to the public that there is uh, information that they should be aware of. So it's just an example of, of um, something that's on the simpler side that we could use as content. Uh, but I think that if we set up, like we talked about before, a Google doc that we would all have access to <laughs> and topics could be on there. And then perhaps there could be a voting tally on the subject, whether or not it's something that gets uh, put online and it's a weekly review. You know, it's, it's, we have the ability to throw the content on there and then rest of the members get to vote whether or not that's a shareable or a, a topic to be discussed and post, posted. So I think that it's a really good start. I think that's a pretty good idea, Casey, but um, I think if we were to do that voting um, thing, we would have to have a subcommittee that's not quorum because then you get into open meeting laws and stuff when you start deliberating on stuff, even though it's just a social media post. Even but, if it's a check a box thing? I think so. Okay. Yeah, but, think, but, yeah. but if we didn't have a quorum in that subcommittee, we could do that. Be fine, I think. So like maybe three of us. Would, but you would, know, and it would it would really be sort of um, lightweight stuff, and then the stuff that's that's a little heavier hitting would be, you know, met once a month in our meetings, and then on the the Facebook or whatever media we use, we can always invite the public to the public speak at these meetings. Um, you know what I mean? And and so I think that this is a really good start for a platform that we can work on. So I would just say, from my view, um, I think it, it makes sense that we could have a smaller group or an individual person, whoever we talk about, you know, would have the responsibility putting up, you know, like non-objective or, um, you know, just um, non-opinionated, you know, news and things out there on the media. But if we were going to take a position on something, that that's something we talk about as a committee at our, at our monthly meeting, and we can, yeah, okay, we're going to support this. And so then we're going to agree to promote that um and but also i feel that on like in, like if we had a facebook page you know it to my my instinct would be to limit commenting from the public on it i think if people share you know something that we post onto another like the group page or whatever there's going to be a lot of people talking there um i just i would worry about because i know that social media can be very like hostile and can be very negative or toxic sometimes you know if, if we have people who are going to an edic page because they want information and, and there's all this hostility going back and forth from people of the community on that page i don't know if that's a if that's what we want I mean, maybe it's what we want but my my impulse is always to to shy away from the, the toxic part of facebook anyway so but that's where i'm coming from I hear you, but if there's no engagement, no one will ever see the posts. It's it's a tricky, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, you know. It's then tricky. Sorry, we need an administrate page administrator who could take down comments that are inappropriate. I mean, I think everybody does that, even next door or whatever that junk is. So, so yes, and. Content management is a non-zero job. And if we have enough to say and enough engagement, that becomes something that somebody has to monitor all the time. And I definitely a thousand percent will not be that person. So if all of the rest of you are willing to do that job, that's superb, but I will never. Um, and, and that's that's where it gets tricky as far as the, the whole commenting section is that that you know 
once once you're committed to putting something out there, then you have to monitor that content, and it's never ending. It could be simple and fine and not an issue, but one issue could just be 400 comments. Right. So one of the things is, too, that uh, my understanding currently is that you can't turn off comments. So if this is a public-facing page where the public can view it, then the public can comment to their heart's content. So, and we know that they do, and that there are certain pages that they, that, that, that our, our friends and colleagues and, and neighbors follow regularly and, and pay attention to. So if that's the kind of engagement that we want, engagement invites commentary, and you have to decide whether you're going to bother engaging with the comments at all, or just let that be and let your post exist as it is. I don't, I, I think that, um, I, yeah, I just don't know. There's another. I think that there's something feels risky about it to me to um, to go to to essentially take a slightly different path from what we would conventionally do, which is decide as a group that we are in favor of X, write a letter in favor of X, send it to a committee, which is not wildly public, but does eventually get made part of the public record because they it, that stuff gets shared at the meeting where they read that we advocated for it. That's different from saying, hey guys, we support this, and then having 35 people go, well, you're stupid, and now we're gonna go to the meeting. I just want to add something. I was a member of a benign Emma Willard School class of 75 or whatever Facebook page started as a place to tell who's married, who's having kids, blah, blah, blah. It devolved into a discussion about rape by teachers of students with finger pointing, naming. It was bad. And it doesn't take much for it to, that kind of stuff to happen i'm just kind of like putting out there like when put what out her thing is uh, you know mo said these are lots of work to maintain i'm not sure this is a great investment of resources that's just my personal opinion i think it so my my response would be it is it's a ton of work which is why even nonprofits have like a social media content manager who gets paid to do that job and also if we just wanted to be a conduit just saying, hey, here's this thing that is happening, it's happening whether you care about it or not, whether you like it or not, it's a meeting. Mm -hmm. I think that that is a different world than, and it, it, if it only particular people have access to the, the posting feature, then I don't know. I don't know enough about it. Chris, you, you had a thought, and then Casey. Yeah, there's another um, path that I don't know if we discussed, but if you were to, if we were to start some sort of EDIC blog, like edic.easthamptonma.org or gov, I can't remember which, and then what you do is you write up your content there, and then you, public, you promote it, not money promote, but you have members of EDIC promoting it onto the different pages or the Twitter or all the other things. One, you have a system of, not system, you have a um, social media agnostic platform. That's the blog. You don't have a comment problem on the official blog because not many people are going to comment on the blogs or you could have no commenting at all. You have a non-social media place for people to see what's going on with EDIC and you just have to let go of what people are going to be commenting on things like Facebook or Twitter. Um, and nor do you have any control, to be honest. You, you can't do anything once you release it into the wild. Um, but then you run into the pr same problem that I mentioned before of engagement. You're not going to have anyone go into that blog on the reg, generally speaking, unless, you know, we stumble upon like a wild civic success that probably we won't. Um, so, yeah, it's tricky. It, but, you know, Gwen, you, you mentioned it's a big job and it is. I, I think it's going to take constant work from some subset of this committee. Yeah. Just the content alone, let alone all the ancillary things that come with it. Casey. So Gwen, you know, going through this conversation, it leads me to thinking of another direction, like you talked about another direction, because the scale of it is so big. But what if we as a committee um, 
were members of Facebook as a committee, and we don't necessarily post things, but yet we make comments on things we see with an opinion that we form. And that way, conversations can happen on that platform. Say the planning board is excited about the waste plant finding um, project that's going on, and the EDIC then responds positively or shit, you know, um, says something that we agree on. Same thing is is if there's you know East Hampton friends and neighbors has a comment about what to do with the schools, we can then add our opinion to what it is and then sort of be a voice on social media in the comment world as opposed to someone's in the voice of telling people what the thing i don't know um can i chime in Back on nuts, Josh. Uh, casey that's a really good point but um the only thing i would worry about is though that we meet you know we meet once a month um, and for us to have something coming from the EDIC, uh, it, it could be tough to do because, you know, we would all have to trust what each other of us says and how we say it and things like that. Right. Um, I was going to go back a little bit to what Chris was saying. Um, the idea of a blog is really cool because it is it is a proactive instead of interactive. We, we as an entity are creating something and putting it out there. Um, sure, people can comment in other places about it if they want, but we're not inviting a conversation, which is like if we had a Facebook page, I think that would invite conversation and it would just be you know as Cassie was talking about about Emma Willard just anyone can put up put anything on there that they want Crap. and it's very hard to control I, I like the idea of, of a blog being proactive and we're just putting this out there you know like on a yeah. web page or something but to, just to just to push back a little bit on that Josh I think that if we were making a proactive blog and we do want people to see it they are going to go where they want with it yeah and, I, and you're right I, there's nothing we can do about that i guess yeah I mean, you know people can talk about us now i mean a couple of years ago we had some reporter from the um from the paper in springfield who was all hung as giving us bad press about i'm not even sure i remember what it was i think it was about the uh, zoning thing about ten thousand square feet uh but there was, there was just a lot of people who wanted to make a make a lot of ruckus about us yeah. so it's those people will always be there sadly what if we fed content to like the east hampton good news page and all the, those other east hampton page um yeah. just a thought probably a bad thought but i i was wondering if we could just say hey how about posting this for us yeah, yeah i think there's something there cassie that i think um so I'm part, I'm on the Commission on Disability, and the, that committee has been talking about this for quite a while. And they, they did recently start to generate this. So they took some time to generate um, posts, like informational posts. And then it went, it actually went to the city of East Hampton uh, paid as the initial place where it got posted from there. And then like the planning department shared out, um, they, they created a survey. And so that was kind of a two-step process where the commission members came up with the, the, the content. East, the city of East Hampton Facebook page posted it, and then we shared it. And then hopefully it got, like, you know, the destination was that it made it to that group page so that a wider audience might see it. So that, that is definitely an option. And I think some of the information that Gwen put together still is kind of the guiding, still guides all that. Um, I think it's a great, I mean, I, I would love to hear you know, each member come up with ideas of things to potentially post about, um, you know, and it might be a little ways out, it might be too far, but um, something on my mind a little bit these days is is the Union Street uh, reconstruction project. So, you know, that's gonna start in like, it'll probably start in early spring. And, you know, it's gonna be kind of a terrible mess for two years and there might be there might be a really good opportunity to like give updates you know i'll, I'll be trying to do it too but you know representing that businesses are open and like you know talking to people and, and putting out a post that like 
small oven bakery, you know, made a cake, you know, for Union Street sewer. <laughs> not, a good, not a good equation. Union Street uh, sidewalks, the sidewalk cake. You know, uh, there might be like that's a little bit ways out, but there might be some time in, in, in the interim to practice a couple posts and use the city of East Hampton's page as the launching point. So yeah, it's just somewhere to think about. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I, um, I want to wrap up this part of our conversation so that we have some time for vacant storefronts. But um, I, I like that suggestion very much. The idea that each of us, um, I, I think that this is a good time to just put it in a Google Doc and nobody's making any comments. You're just putting in a place. Here are some topics that you can imagine creating some, some content you're a content creator now. Um, what are the ideas that you have? And then let's go from there and see if there are ways that we can um, finagle our way into into that that world in some creative way. Is that is that a useful approach for the moment? Come to August seventeenth with those ideas having been put in a doc. Okay. Supa dupa. All right, we're done with that. Close, close, close. Nope, save, save, save. Then close, close, close. And then what are we doing? Who are you people? What are we doing? OK. Continue discussion of vacant storefront ordinance language slash process. Cassie, Chris, Paul, basically everybody. We're all enthusiastic. So Cassabel, I know that's not your real name, but I like it. You made revised regulation language available to us this afternoon. Indeed, I did. Would you like to share your screen and talk us through what you got there? I'm going to make you a co-host, because otherwise you won't be able to. OK. Please hold. Wait a minute. Back. Back. Am I projecting now? Not yet. Try again. OK. Do I have to do like screen share or something? Yep. Share screen. Yep. Button. You would think I didn't live through COVID. <laughs> you must be new to Earth. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, nothing. I, is this what you really want me to do? Just kind of walk through this? Well, did anything, what, what changed since the last time? Anything? Okay, I added a definition for downtown business district, yeah. um, which needs some filling in here. Yeah. And um, that's old. I changed the review of public art from the planning and community development, whoever, to a citizen jury. That's, it sounds scary, but <laughs> I mean, I'm happy for different wording. I added street facing to vacant building yeah. um, and added the um, to be considered a vacant building, you have to be lo located in the downtown business district. Okay. Anytime there was a reference to interfacing with a city department or city person, I changed it to city in capital letters so that it could get filled in. And that's just the list of information that needs to be contained in the registration. This is the, I, let me see, what is this? Okay, this is about registering. Yeah. And this may, uh, yes, the city can declare someone exempt from this rule. Then, the annual registration fee of $100. I think that's where we left off. And um, we need a mass, uh, East Hampton equivalent to this MGL. Then that we said, as I recall, that if you don't register, you're gonna be subject to a $100 per day fine. And then I added the same language from Arlington about it being considered a municipal charges lien. I'm not sure if that's correct, but um, we had talked about that last week. And then um, failure to pay. I reorganized this section um, so that it's 
broke it into separate clauses. This is about the waiver. Here's waiver one is on financial hardship, the 30 day review period, quarterly basis, then the public art display with the so-called citizen jury. I'm seeing Burt Lancaster there. <laughs> then um, nothing here. This is the part where you have to display your name and telephone number at the property. And the piece about inspections, violations, nothing different really. And is condemn Jeff, is condemn this the same as being unsafe? I don't think so. Is it duplicative? I guess. I don't know. I don't think it's duplicative because I would, I would, so I have no idea. I don't want me to make it up, but that's my wife always yells at me for making stuff up. But I would say, well, I love making stuff up. Unsafe, uh, a determination of unsafe would happen first, but, and then and then it would be condemned. Like, I think there's two different actions. Okay. Like, I think unsafe, is, unsafe warrants, like, there be another step. Okay. Somehow secure it. And then I think condemned is like, it's, it's done. It's been it's a really problem. bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I added this piece about being condemned and not eligible for any kind of exemptions from anything, and then that's it. So um, I have a question. We have the bit for, uh, I, I don't have it open on my screen right now, so I'm looking at yours. Um, about the annual registration fee. If there's an annual registration fee of $100, we're only getting $100. And we had talked previously about quarterly inspections being tied to the-, the Okay. Fee, right? I'm sorry to scroll. No, that's fine. Inspections. So I'll clean it up, but you need to pay $100 at every inspection. Yeah. If we could just write it in our in our terms. $100 every yeah, quarter, no. please, per building inspection. Um, so that the... $100 on, say, say it's for the year, $100 on January 1st just to get registered. And then on April 1st, you would pay $100 for your inspection. I think it was just 100 bucks quarterly. Was that yeah. what we spoke about? I'm not sure now. From my uh, memory... From my memory, I thought we had originally talked about four hundred dollars a year, and then we talked about having quarterly inspections and how that cost would then be broken out over quarters. Right. So it's a hundred dollars a quarter because they're tied specifically to building inspections. Got it. So, and I think the um, I know that we discussed this, but it, it's not showing up the way I remember discussing it. Is uh, Arlington's original language said you have seven days once your property is vacant to to register it as vacant. We've changed that in this to 90. Correct. But by then, I mean, I feel like seven days is a reasonable amount of time for somebody to go, this is vacant. I don't have a tenant coming in. I, it's time to get it registered rather than I have nine. I, I don't know. I can't. Is that what we decided that we wanted to give people three months um, la lag time to it's, get it together? It's, it's and one, after that, we register it. It's it's one quarter. Why why do they need to to go through another process of filing some paperwork when they may have a tenant that's available in a month, and then that tenant drags their feet for another month, and then they move in. So they moved in you know, two months later. But in the meantime, the landlord had to go through the scramble of buying this thing. It's, it's sort of like, I think it makes a okay. little grace period that, you know, we only really want to do this because this is work. This is work Yeah. for landlords, for, for the city, um, for problematic places, you know, so yeah. 90 day grace period is, is, you know, as a someone who owns commercial real estate, who owns apartment buildings is, is workable. Okay, great. Yeah. That's fine with me. We don't want to um, alienate anyone. You said, Josh? I would say we don't want to alienate anyone. Well, we're going to, so let's so get the idea right well, now. Well, let's only alienate the problem people, like what she okay. said, the dirt on my shoes person. 
Okay. So if you're if you're vacant on January 1st, that's the day your tenant leaves, you have to register by March 1st, right? No, March 31st, April 1st, you have 90 oh, yeah. days. Yeah. And then you do you pay $100 then? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Then four plus three is seven one inspection pay a hundred dollars. Okay. So I, so I think one of our one of our things that. though is that we, that hundred dollars to register I think has to be tied to a building inspection. Doesn't it? Because we can't have it just here's that because otherwise it's basically a tax. Right. It has to be tied to a service, but but I think. Um, I don't know whether or not the service actually has to happen. If they register on April for uh, March on four one, and then get a tenant and don't have the inspection, I think that that's legit. I, th I think I think the idea of having an inspection from the beginning is a good idea on the next level because when someone goes to the city and says, "I'm looking for permitting for a hair salon," um, but the, if the inspector was in there already and said, "Like, no, that doesn't." I can tell already that doesn't have the parts to, to handle that. So it, I think that it's a, it's a good idea to bring the inspector first. So I think, yeah, let's let's keep that feature in there so that there's an inspection tied to your check for $100. No, um, businesses now, are they're not paying for inspections now, I believe. So this correct. would only be if you have no tenant, then you pay for the inspection. Yeah. Uh, well, they're paying. They're paying for an inspection when they need an inspection, like if they do something. Otherwise, they're not getting inspected. What if what if say somebody was had a, a vacant space for ninety days, went through the uh, didn't go through the inspection, brought a tenant in there. The tenant's in there. The building inspector comes in at some point and says, "Wow, this is not a legal means of egress. Um, this business." has to figure this out or cannot let the public in, in their space. And then this tenant went through all this work. It's sort of like preempting, uh, at, you know, code compliancy with the, for the next tenant. Mm. I think you should keep it. I think you should keep it in for now, tied tied to an inspection. I mean, I think I, I'm guessing you guys know, I mean, it'll go through, this will go kind of through the ringer. Of, of people's review so if there's a glitch or an issue later i think it'll it'll come up but i think i think the concept seems good to just tie it to some kind of inspection you know at some point we'll have to get the building inspector to review it um but i don't think we're i don't, I don't think it's quite there yet but it will come up i'm sure at some point yeah i think that's a good point we should just try to get our intent down because the solicitor is going to look at it, the building inspector the city council the ordinance review so if we get our intent done, we're okay. That's a good point. Thank you for that reminder, everybody. Um, so we have just good? Two and a half minutes left. So um, before we before we go, I want to say I did get in touch with Salem Derby, who's on the ordinance committee, to ask if we could get on one of their next two summer meetings, which are next Tuesday or Wednesday, and August tenth. And he said, I have to talk to the group. I'm sure we can do that, but we then would be subject to open meeting law, yada, yada. So uh, I have not heard back um, any confirmation of either of those dates, but I will let you know when I do. I, I will follow up with him uh, because we were going to talk with them about do we, what do we do with the idea of a letter? How do, we, how do we engage with the community before, after? What's the timing there? What do you recommend? That sort of thing. Jeff? Well, that's all good. That's good stuff to be. That's a good conversation to be having with Salem. I think that's good. Um, I just had a minor, I guess, uh, comment. Maybe it's a request, but I think with the public art and the citizen jury, I think that's. I think that's fine. But I think there is another option that we have a public art um, committee. So you know, it's a it's a committee that's you know charged with um, looking at establishing and kind of maintaining public art in the city. And that might be a built-in review opportunity that we are, like we could, it kind of just would fall in line with the city. So it would be like the city of East Hampton Public Art Committee could be the group who would review that. Um, just an idea. Uh, it's just the, 
it would send it to an existing committee. That's Can I follow great. up on that, uh, Jeff? We yep. talked about throwing that ECA's way, uh, but we didn't talk about the Public Arts Committee. We, mm -hmm. I just simply said that if another ask for that committee, which already is program uh, laden, to give them more responsibility is, was a big ask. But the subcommittee actually sounds brilliant. Yeah. And, you know, it's different. I, it, I am really cognizant that there, we are talking about apples and oranges, but the public art committee did establish a public art policy. And so it's more, it was more geared towards okay. like donations of big pieces. Cause there, there's been quite a few requests for people that I want, like, I want to donate this piece of art. And I just, all I want is you to put it up somewhere. And the, the town, the city decided that we kind of needed a policy and this is different than that, but they're kind of used to looking at something and giving it some kind of like the policy has a, an evaluation criteria just to give you a, the, this group a sense that there has been some standards created for looking at public art and it's not necessarily a perfect fit but maybe it's a good placeholder for now that's great okay all right so we've made some progress there i will follow up with salem so that we can get on an agenda um what other tasks have come out of this cassie i need to update again and then bring it back for a final blessing or send it out in advance for a final for a medium final blessing or yeah. okay. Anything else? No, I'm asking, is that it? Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Um, all right, anything? On, that, on the letter, you know, based on these conversations, what how we're really gonna phrase it, but okay. it's not a huge thing. There was my email that got shared. I spoke with Lindsay and the building inspector does not invoice the city or anything like that for inspections. It's just part of the salary job. And um, I spoke with Karen who was designing the new website I think she was in the, the heat of it at the moment, but um, she said, yes, we can get a page. She wasn't sure if we could embed a frame of the Google Doc, but at the very least, we can put a link to the Google Doc if that's how we if that's how we decide to go with it. So yeah, we can get communication with the website. So all okay. is good. Okay. All right. And I think that that'll, that'll be an ongoing topic as well. How does this actually get managed and monitored, that sort of thing. So that's great. Okay, everybody. I think it's time to wrap this up. Would anyone like to move that we wrap it up? I make an agenda that we uh, wrap this up. <laughs> a second. Standing all in favor of leaving for a different part of your evening. Holler aye. 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 Hooray. All right. Thanks, everybody. You're great. Have a lovely night. Take care. Great weekend, everyone. Bye.